the complainant says they have an active shooter in the building. A second call says they uh, are being attacked. In less than a year, the United States has seen two of the deadliest white supremacist attacks in its recent history. We're taking on AK-47 fire from out the uh, front of the synagogue. In October of 2018, a gunman murdered 11 Jewish worshipers at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 7 uh, suspects talking about all these Jews need to die. Then in August, 22 people were shot dead in an attempt to kill as many Latinos as possible in El Paso, Texas. Just nine months apart, these attacks were connected through the ideology of white supremacy. And only right gradually did I think we all come to realize how extensive this underground network is of people who have bought into this hateful belief system. Those things are being nurtured by our president in his language and actually stoked. It gives license to people like the shooter to do violence against communities. The Pittsburgh suspect was critical of Donald Trump, and the El Paso shooter distanced himself from the president in his manifesto. But both men framed their actions as responses to crises, real or imagined, that the president has amplified, even echoing his language about minorities and immigrants. At a Florida rally in May, the president rhetorically asked the crowd what he should do with migrants who crossed the border. But how do you stop these people? One of the president's supporters yelled, shoot them, and the president laughed. That's only in the panhandle you can get away with that state. In the wake of these shootings, conservative pundits with large platforms have also come under scrutiny. White supremacy, that's the problem. This is a hoax. It's a conspiracy theory used to divide the country and keep a hold on power. Is this the president's fault? He said he's going to stop the Is this the, the president's fault? This is my question for no. you. Or will leaders sit passively back as the invasion continues? The number one conservative media for us in the United States is Fox News Channel. They're trustworthy. Our country is being stolen. In this episode of Fault Lines, we examine the ideology behind these recent attacks and how this racist discourse is seeping into the mainstream. I just remember hearing a lot of people screaming for help, screaming for the ambulances. Then I remember seeing the sun and hearing the helicopters. And then after that, I was just basically just laying there and praying that he wouldn't kill my daughter. You know, and that because he went through, through the same door that she was in. On August 3rd, Luis Calvillo was at a Walmart store in El Paso, Texas, when a 21-year-old white supremacist opened fire. Luis, a U.S. Army veteran, was shot five times. So when he shot me, I turned around towards the direction that I heard the shots from. And that's when I saw him and, and the weapon that he was carrying. He wasn't saying nothing. He was just shooting randomly. After five surgeries and more than two months in the hospital, Luis has finally made it home. Say hello, girls. Hello. Invite everyone to come over. Come over. Hello. Hello. On the day of the attack, Luis and his family went to Walmart to promote a fundraiser for his 10-year-old daughter's soccer team. Five of the parents were shot. All the girls escaped, but when Luis woke up, he learned that his father, Jorge Calvillo Garcia, was among the 22 people murdered that day. When I was uh, sedated, I had asked about my dad, and they told me what had happened to him, and that I just cried a lot, that I just cried and cried and cried. But when I woke up, I mean, I knew that he wasn't around us anymore. I wasn't there to say the last goodbye. I wasn't there when he got cremated. Uh, everything just came after I woke up. All right, say hi, girls. All right, tell them to come support. Tell everybody to come support. There you go, there you go. I just think that if it wouldn't, I wouldn't created that, that Facebook life, my dad wouldn't arrive because he didn't know anything about the fundraiser. 
he might have been alive still, and it just, it just sucks, you know? Witnesses described the gunman passing over some of the white customers while targeting anyone who looked Latino to him. After the shooting, Luis and his wife, Marcella, read the gunman's manifesto searching for answers. You read it, and then you're like, well, this is happening because of our president influence, because of everything that he's saying, because everything that he is influencing into these young minds. That's it. I mean, you put one with the other, and you're like, bingo. They're almost his words. Yeah. What he says about the Texas invasion of Hispanics and that Hispanics that were taking over the jobs and that were taking over everything. Our president makes it seem like that every person that crossed the bridge is a criminal. And if that's not the case, the criminals come from here and look what they do. The number of hate crime murders last year was the highest in over 20 years, according to FBI data. Over the years, black Americans have faced the most frequent incidents of hate crimes and 2018 saw an increase in the targeting of Latinos. Dr. Kathleen Ballou studies the history of the white power movement in America. These aren't just one-off events. They are part of a rising wave of action. These activists share a common set of ideologies, symbols, phrases, and kind of modes of action that connect them with one another. Now, that's important not only to understand the meaning of each of these acts of violence, but to connect them together as part of a movement. We printed out the, the manifesto from the El Paso shooter, and I, I don't want to give him a platform, mm -hmm. but is this white supremacy? I know that the media will probably call me a white supremacist anyway and blame Trump's rhetoric. The media is infamous for fake news, he says immediately, repeating Trump's rhetoric. Right. It also has a lot of highly symbolic, coded phrases that would be familiar to somebody in this movement. Um, so like, Hispanic invasion of Texas, the replacement, invasion, great replacement, this has become popular recently, um, and kind of it's another example of this idea of the white race being overrun by other people. Invasion is now attached to this idea of replacement. And invasion of immigrants has to do with the feeling of being overrun by people of color. If you look at the moment in which both of those attack, attacks happened, they both came on the back of President Trump voicing very loudly his opinion that essentially there was an invasion going on to the United States. This is an invasion. When you see these caravans starting out with 20,000 people, that's an invasion. I was badly criticized for using the word invasion. It's an invasion. There's no question that, that Trump's words influenced them, and there's no question that Trump was influenced by the work of Tucker Carlson and others at Fox News. This is not immigration. Immigration happens with the consent of the host country. This is happening by force, without our consent. What's happening at the border is a flat-out invasion. We are being overwhelmed every day. Calling anything but an invasion at this point is just not being honest with people. Tonight, a system-wide meltdown at our southern border. This is real. Democrats who want to replace you, the American voters, with newly amnestied citizens. Their political success does not depend on good policies, but on demographic replacement. Some people call it an invasion. It's like an invasion. Is it particularly dangerous when the President of the United States so frequently uses the word invasion and then it's validated by every anchor on your favorite news channel? There's a real big difference between taking up a gun and following this rhetoric to its farthest implication. But those activists look for opportunities to use and weaponize whatever is in the prevailing culture. Trump condemned the attacks in Pittsburgh and El Paso. Two days after El Paso, he read a prepared speech from the White House. Good morning. In one voice, our nation must condemn racism, bigotry, and white supremacy. These sinister ideologies must be defeated. The White House did not respond to our request for comment. A month after the Walmart attack, national lawmakers hosted a hearing in El Paso, examining the relationship between anti-immigrant rhetoric and domestic terrorism. No Republican members of Congress attended. Unfortunately, it is only too fitting that this hearing is being held in El Paso a place that has had to endure the target painted on our backs because of anti-immigrant rhetoric, and the rhetoric has only escalated over time. 
for many of us, those words have become a matter of life and death. Can you draw a through line between the rhetoric of President Trump and the conservative media in America to what happened here in El Paso? Obviously, the actions that that individual took are his actions, his responsibility. But there is also a direct line from the rhetoric that we have heard from the president um, calling immigrants uh, thugs and rapists, invaders, infestation of this country. Uh, the, the murderer in his own manifesto used some of the same terms, practically quoted it. It's been just over a year since a white supremacist opened fire in Pittsburgh's Tree of Life synagogue in what became the deadliest attack on Jews in American history. The perpetrator allegedly targeted the synagogue because one of the congregations there had hosted a service in support of immigrants, calling it a refugee Shabbat. It was part of a national project spearheaded by Hayas, a global Jewish nonprofit that aids refugees. And it started out as the Jewish Immigrant Aid Society, and it was helping people like my grandparents come from Russia. And it was Jews helping Jews. They now say, we used to help immigrants because they were Jews. Now we help immigrants because we are Jews. Carolyn, Eve, and Donna are leaders of Dor Hadash one of the three Jewish congregations targeted at the synagogue that day. Before the attack, the alleged shooter posted online, Hayas likes to bring invaders in that kill our people. I can't sit by and watch my people get slaughtered. Screw your optics, I'm going in. He knew the address, unfortunately, from Hayas's website because we were listed as a congregation that was participating in the National Refugee Shabbat. And when I found that out, I Talk about my heart sank. It's, it's, it was incomprehensible. It's still incomprehensible. It's something but, we'll carry with us for yes, the rest of our but lives. But doing something that you thought was a nice and totally harmless activity, like leading a National Refugee Shabbat, that it would inadvertently lead this man to the door is horrific. I've always believed in social justice, human rights, and it's what I do. I never wanted that to hurt anyone else um, or lead to anyone else being hurt. So it's, you know, it's, it's something that I struggle with a lot is that, you know, something our small committee did and was supported by our congregation um, led to this man coming and killing 11 souls. But let, me, let me just correct you because we've had this conversation <laughs> and what you did did not lead to this man. There were many things that led to this man coming. Nobody would have wanted us to disassociate ourselves with Hyas. And we know that this man simply hated Jews, and he was looking for Jews to kill. If it hadn't been us, it would have been others. And it was only as, we, as the press dug further into his social media that I began to realize, and all of us began to realize, how much he was involved in this whole underground network of white supremacy, of hate, and how much that is, at its core, also a deeply anti-Semitic belief system in which the Jews are behind everything somehow. In the white power movement, Jewish people are seen as part of a corrupt international global elite that dominates the United States and is bent on the eradication of the white race. In the Tree of Life shooting, we even have a clearer example of that connection because the attacker talked about the relationship between that synagogue and efforts to help refugees and to um, help with aid to people coming into the nation. In the weeks leading up to the shooting, President Trump and conservative media figures focused on a caravan of migrants trying to legally claim asylum at the U.S. southern border. We watched another migrant caravan snake its way up from Central America. It's not a caravan, it's an invasion. We are getting some really bad characters coming into this country. The president pushed a false claim that so-called unknown Middle Easterners had infiltrated the caravan. But certainly you have people coming up 
through the southern border, from the Middle East and other places that are not appropriate for our country. But even one ISIS, even one poison pill sure. is too many in a caravan. Like the fear is that some of them are uh, radical Islamist terrorists. Where are they from? Who brought them here? Why are they coming here? They also furthered a debunked conspiracy theory that the caravan was funded by billionaire George Soros, a frequent target of anti-Semitic attacks by the right. Who do you think is behind these caravans? A lot of speculation that is George Soros. You can tell the Democrats, George Soros, and the angry mob that's coming here, you either come the right way like everyone else or be ready to face the military. And the right to request asylum at the U.S. border is protected under both U.S. and international law. So it's October 2018, it's right before the midterms, and he starts to whip the public up into this frenzy by using the migrant caravan. You got some bad people in those groups. You got some tough people in those groups. Something that happens all the time. That is never a story. And he decided to make it a story. It was all anybody could talk about. And it became a, a means for him to whip up his base into this idea of invasion, into this idea of, of uh, uh, people pouring across the border and that the only way to stop them is to have his, you know, his, his wall put up. Will Trump get the funding for his wall? Will the mass migration from other poor countries in Central America be stopped at all, ever? The White House has vowed to stop this caravan using the armed forces if necessary but it keeps coming. And so it was, a, it was a rallying cry for the people on the very fringes, on the very far right, that they needed to take it upon themselves to go and be on the front lines and stop this from happening. And what Fox does is create that final sense of, wow, it's happening and it's happening now. And so what took place with Tree of Life is they spent so many weeks hammering home, not just that it was happening, but that nobody was doing anything about it. Fox News again came under scrutiny after the El Paso shooting. And a number of companies even withdrew their advertisements from Tucker Carlson's show. So this is one of the things that Tucker Carlson said uh, immediately after the shooting in El Paso, that white supremacy was a hoax. If you were to assemble a list, a hierarchy of concerns or problems this country faces, where would white supremacy be on the list? Right up there with Russia, probably. It's actually not a real problem in America. White supremacy, that's the problem. This is a hoax just like the Russia hoax. What's amazing about this in particular is they call, he calls this a hoax, which we know is not true, but you know, every bit of data says that right-wing extremism and white supremacy is committing more acts of terrorism and committing more acts of murder in the states than any other form of, of, of political terror. President Trump and Fox News have an unusually close relationship. Since Trump came into office, at least 20 people have worked both for his administration and Fox News. And again, Tucker's been very good, I have to say. He's been good. Smart. He's been great. Tucker. We know that he watches uh, Tucker Carlson. We know he retweets him all the time. And there are, like, people have done research showing that, like, the story will pop up on a far right side, like InfoWars. Tucker Carlson will decide to do a segment on it, and minutes later, President Trump will start tweeting about the very same issue that Tucker Carlson just did a show on. Fox News declined our request for interviews with two of their most prominent hosts, Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram. They've sent us an official on-the-record statement from Fox News. It says Fox News denounces all forms of racism and the defamatory, reckless accusations about our host are both irresponsible and dangerous. For 17 years straight, Fox News has been the most watched cable news network in America. And it's consistently home to four of the top five cable news programs in the country. Number two on that list is Tucker Carlson's show. We have one more shot here to try to talk to Tucker and it's, we believe we have his cell phone. So we're gonna give him a call and let's see if we can't get him on the line. Hello? Hello, calling for Tucker Carlson. Who's this? Josh Rushing with Fault Lines on Al Jazeera. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but I like the sound of it. So uh, I'm actually standing out in front of Fox News just hoping to talk to you. <laughs> you know, I'd be happy to, but I um, I would say, um, you know, you can assess what, I mean, I have an, an hour-long live show. You do? Nights a week, so you can, you can 
assess for yourself what you think of, of we, what I think. Uh, I don't know what you mean by well, we've watched a lot of your show. Well, what I mean is, like, down in El Paso, there are people who say that they feel like that you and, and the, right, your right. rhetoric me, I, puts I, a target on their back. Do, hey, Josh. Yeah. You can you can assess for yourself what you think. Um, well, so. I, but, the, but these are the people who survived the shooting and say that they feel like there's a target on the back because of the kind of rhetoric that, that you put out on a nightly right. basis. What would you say to them? Not to me, but to them. Maybe it would be helpful if you just sent the questions to media relations, but I... I'm not supposed to, uh, I mean, that's that's the rule here, as you know. Are, so. You're a big enough guy at Fox. You can tell them that you want to sit down and talk, right? I mean, you, you have, like, the biggest program on there for a young audience, the only growing program on there, I think. The President of the United States stands up and, and says your name, lavishly praises your name. Tucker? Twenty-two people that got killed here in El Paso. Is that a, was that a hoax? Was that not true? No. And who killed all those people? Right. Somebody that believed in those ideas. So how can it be a hoax? It's easy for somebody that has bodyguards, but for us, now even going into a store is dangerous. We don't know when the next cycle is gonna show up. Or what minds he could have awakened, you know? another little kid that wants to go ahead and, and follow his steps or... Or do something worse. Bigger. Bigger. Drain the swamp, liberal tears, come get it here. $15, two for 25. After the El Paso attack, the New York Times reported that in the previous seven months, President Trump's campaign had run at least 2,000 Facebook ads with the word invasion. Hats and flags, guys, hats and flags. We saw not just that Fox News ramped up the attacks, but then obviously the Trump campaign started running thousands of Facebook ads. Since the shooting, his campaign has spent over a million dollars on immigration-related Facebook ads, more than on any other political issue this year. I think Trump and Fox News see what happened in El Paso as unfortunate, but sort of something that's going to happen when you launch a campaign like this. They see the political benefits of, of making Americans terrified uh, about immigrants coming into this country and using that as a rallying cry. They want to have drugs pouring into our country. You have to have a wall and you have to stop it. We don't want dangerous criminal aliens roaming free in North Carolina. We want to take care of it. And so when I think about what happened over the summer and how the very next day they doubled down on the, not just the terminology, but the warnings behind it, they understand now that that is a, a tool in their toolkit. And worse, that, that it's probably the, one of their most effective ones in this moment. The illegals, I mean, you know, they're running the drugs. They're doing all kind of bad stuff. Especially when you see demographic, quick demographic change in the area, it can get very dangerous for them and for the people living there. Have you looked at all the people that have been killed by illegal aliens across the United States that have been raped and shot by illegal aliens? Let them come, let them come in legally. If I was me president, I'd get rid of all the son of a guns. All of them. You would do what? Get rid of them back to the countries. You can't do anything to stop them. What we've seen is we've seen Trump go back to his playbook. Uh, as he launches his campaign for 2020. I mean, he launched his, his campaign by calling uh, Mexican immigrants rapists and murderers, for literally at his first press conference. So uh, that's been his message all along. It's really important that people start realizing if you characterize people as, uh, as, as criminals and invaders and bad hombres, or you talk about Jews in particular ways, it invokes fear in people. People get so afraid. And not just people being shot, but people being treated different, differently all over the country. As the 2020 presidential election looms, the nation's attention will be on President Trump, the words he uses, and the power they carry. If you have the largest platform on the planet and you decide to use that to uh, amplify white supremacist ideas, then whether you are a racist 
or not, whether you are truly racist or not, is, is kind of moot. There's always been racism, always in this country, but I think since Trump got to be president, it's acceptable to be racist, because the president is a racist, so now it's acceptable to be a racist. You're either uh, in league with racists or you are truly racist yourself. But in terms of the impact of what you're saying and doing, it doesn't really matter. And he's seen the consequences and he doesn't care. He sees the consequences and he still doesn't care. To protect your family, you must defeat open borders. And by the way, we're building that wall and it's going up very big.